I wanted to sing that song due to the fact that our God is uh, a little strange in the way he works, doesn't he? To send his son to die for us. This morning, our message is entitled, What Makes Sense to God? Let's bow our heads together for a word of prayer, and we will go into God's word together. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you so much, because this morning we have an opportunity to come and fellowship with one another and fellowship with you, because we have a season where the where the world has an opportunity to hear about Jesus Christ who has been born in a manger, to live a life, to leave an example for each one of us, but ultimately, Lord, to be led to the, to the cross of Calvary to die for us, to be buried in the tomb, and to come out of the grave, Lord, to bring us the promise that if we believe, that we can also have the promise of life eternal. Now, Lord, as we study your word, we ask that you may help us to know more about this man, Jesus. For we pray it in his name. Amen. Amen. Go with me in your Bibles to the book of, the book of Isaiah chapter 55. I'm sitting down today. Is that okay? Yeah. Isaiah 55 and verse 9. Isaiah 55 and verse 9. Now go ahead and get my Bible open here. There you go. Isaiah 55, verse 9. Sorry. We're going to start at verse 8, guys. Excuse me. Verse 8. Isaiah 55, verse 8. It says this. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts more than your thoughts. There's a, a movie that it plays upon a, a historical account. Now, of course, like most movies, uh, if you guys watch movies, like most movies, they exaggerate. They, they tend to bend the truth a little bit, right? They need it for drama, for effect. The book... The movie is called Troy. Now, I don't recommend that you actually watch the movie. I watched this a long time ago. It's, a, it's an interesting movie. It's got some action and of some romance, but of course it's got blood and gore and violence. But it built upon uh, the history of warfare in Greece and Macedonia and, and the conquering of the world, so to speak, just a little bit right after Alexander the Great. And it shows at the start of the movie this scene of... Uh, the best two warriors coming out to fight. And you find that the two warriors are these, these men that are muscular. You know what I'm talking about? The, the kind in the movies, whenever the light shines on them, their muscles glisten you know, with all the oil that they put. And there's just, just these big, heroic, muscly men. And that's what the movie portrays as the heroes. Of course, one is a lot bigger than the other. But you find that in warfare, the movie's portrayed portraying the fact that the biggest heroes, the, the greatest warriors, are men of bulk. There are these great men. When we look upon history, we find that human historical accounts oftentimes will talk about these giants of men. In fact, one of the greatest stories we hear in folklore is of Hercules. We talk about in the Greco-Roman Empire of Atlas, the man that is carrying the world. Do you know what I'm talking about? These are the men that in this world that we highlight as being the element of what it means to be a man and what it means to be a hero. And I mean, it's normal. It's common sense. In fact, we live in a world that we highlight muscle and we highlight image. In fact, uh, for those of you guys that have an Instagram account, how many of you guys do not have an Instagram account? Raise your hand. Okay, for everybody else, for those of you guys that have an Instagram, it's about image. Charles, you, you, and, you and I, you know, we're, we're millennials. We, we know about image. They try to find the girl with the prettiest face and the beautiful hair and body that accentuates all the right curves and the men with all the right muscles. 
We live in a society that this is what they highlight, an, an opulent lifestyle. In fact, there was this famous TV show in America that was called MTV. You guys know what MTV is? It's been around for a while, but MTV, there, there was this particular show that they had that was called MTV Cribs, where they showed the houses of the rich and famous. Now, I know there was a, there was a TV show as well, of the rich and famous, where they show you know, that the swimming pools were bigger than the than Olympic-sized swimming pools, and the garage for vehicles would fit 10 different vehicles, but they weren't, you know, Toyota, they weren't Toyota Hilux trucks and, and little, you know, Fiat Pandas like the rest of us. Oh no, these were Rolls Royce. The, these were the vehicles that when people drive down the street, they think, oh, that person's important. That's what this world highlights. Opulence, image, muscles, the beauty of the world. And it's human nature to see that, okay, this person, he must be important because look what he drives, right? Or as we drive down the street, we see these big houses, like, oh, that person, they must be, they must be somebody, Grace. That house, they must be important because they probably have 20 bedrooms and how many bathrooms and big kitchen. They must be important. Or we look at somebody's looks and we think, oh, they must be greatly loved and admired because look how pretty they are, how handsome or how muscular they are. Human nature is to highlight the external things. We do this. It makes, it makes sense to us. It makes perfect sense that when we want to send somebody out into the battlefield, we want to send out the biggest and the strongest. That we want somebody to lead. In fact, the reflection of our one of the presidents in America right now, Donald Trump, or the president of America, is people say, well, he must, he must be a good president because look how rich he is. He knows how to manage his money. He, he's a born leader. These things are sensical. They're normal to us. And therefore, what we sometimes conclude about God is if it makes sense to us, Jill, Gene, if it, if it, is, if it makes sense to us, it must make sense to God. How, how many times our prayers... And our conversations with God are us trying to convince God about our sense and our logic. And if we are able to present our case to God in a way that makes sense, God must answer our prayers. But yet, what makes sense to God oftentimes does not makes sense to us. What makes sense to God oftentimes does not make sense. And, and I, will, I will start with my conclusion. I will start with my conclusion. Sometimes, just sometimes, I wish God would make more sense to me. Sometimes I wish God would make more sense to me. At this time of the year when we talk about Christmas and we talk about, well, if your children want you to know, if the children want to know that the parents love them, they, they tend to quantify the love by how many presents are under the Christmas tree. Oh, my mom must really love me. Dad must really love me because look how many gifts we have. But yet when we find the sense of the nativity, we, when we find the God sense of the Christmas story, it's very contrary to human sense. In fact, over the past 2,000 years, as humanity has taken over the Christmas story, I'll say that again, over the past 2,000 years, as humanity has taken over the Christmas story, we have replaced the sense of God with a sense of humanity. So let's start by saying this. As we read the book of Isaiah, chapter 55, verses 8 and 9, we see two things. One, God's thoughts... And his ways are different than our ways. Because his ways are found where? In heaven. Our, our ways are on earth. We, we have an earth's view of things. God has a bird's view of things. But then in verse 9 it says, Just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. Is it possible? Is it possible that if God's sense of things, that if God's ways are are higher, and God's sense are higher, would it not make sense for us to therefore 
subject our way of thinking to his way of thinking and our lifestyle to his lifestyle and our way of living to his way of living, it would make more sense. In fact, we find some elements of God's ways in Scripture. We find his thoughts that make absolutely no sense to us. I'll give you an example. God allowed for a little shepherd boy, 16, 17 year old, to fight against a well-seasoned veteran in war, a giant named Goliath. He allowed for a boy, maybe about five foot eight, five foot nine years old, the average height of a man, to fight against a man that was, historically speaking, at least in the Bible, he was nine cubits. Some people believe he was about 10 to 11 feet tall. The sense of God would allow for a little boy, we would call this child abuse. Would we not? For a little 16, 17 year old boy to go and fight against a well seasoned soldier with the knowledge that. Clearly, this, must, this boy will die and lose this fight. But the sense of God is to allow for the weak to lead and have victory over the strong. The sense, the sense of God, Jesus says, He says, if you want to be the greatest, you have to be a servant. You have to be the least. He says, if you want to be first, says you have to be strong and the, and the epitome of Jesus message is, is written by his brother James Jesus brother James go with me to the book of James chapter 1 Jesus teaching that the greatest must be the least that the first must be the last is written down very appropriately by Jesus own brother in James chapter 1 verse 27 the last part but we'll read verse 27 James 1, 27, it says, Pure and undefiled religion before God and Father is this, to visit the orphan and the widow in their time of trouble. But here's the punchline. He says, to keep oneself unspotted or unstained by the world. What's the stain of the world? The stain of the world is to operate under our rationale and our human inclination is to look out for myself first. In fact... That's why it has to be taught. My, my brother-in-law was a, he was in the United States Navy before he passed away. Jessica's brother was in the United States Navy. And it is taught to the Marines and to the Navy, to the Merrymen, and it's taught to the sailors that when you are in trouble, the first thing that you're taught to do is to find a way for yourself to get into the boat. That's what they're taught. It's in the training. My own cousin, who's in the Navy right now, he is a, what's called a commander. He is third from admiral, which is the third highest possible rank in the military for the Navy. It is taught in the manual to our soldiers that in time of crisis, if the boat is sinking, think of how you're going to get out of the boat. How are you going to save yourself? Human nature is to try and put yourself first. That's why James says... That the stain that we must keep ourselves unspotted and unstained by the world to think about others, to think about the widow, and to think about the orphan. I, I believe that God's sense will oftentimes leave you in second place. That if we were to subject our rationale and our way of thinking as, as humans and as Christians, if we were to follow God's moral, God's moral compass, His moral paradigm, it is to live for others and put them first. The rationale of the greatest being last, being least, of being the servant, the first being last, the weak to lead the strong, that rationale is totally contrary to what the world teaches. In fact, we find that the first deception in Genesis chapter 3, the serpent tells the woman, it says, you will be like gods. You will be like gods, knowing good and evil. The temptation, the sense of sin and the sense of the world is to put self first, but where the sense of God is saying no, put others first. So how did God carry out his sense? How, how is it that God made his sense physical? How did God make a concept, a moral objective of putting others first? How did God make that 
logical and real to us. Let's find this sense. When God sent His Son to be born, in the book of Luke chapter 2, we read that He picked a, a woman. But in the book of Luke chapter 2, He didn't just pick any woman. He picked a, a woman that was a virgin, right? Let me ask you guys a question. How many of you guys feel perfectly, felt perfectly capable whenever you had your first child saying, oh, I'm going to be a perfect mother. I know what to do. How many of you guys, whenever you had your first child, you thought to yourself when the child, their temperature is at, you know, a certain degrees, but it's not, it's not quite a fever. You're like, I got this under control. How many of you guys felt under control when you had your first child? Maybe your second child. Maybe about the third child. Okay, I'm getting, the whole, I'm getting a grasp of things, right? Yeah, about the third child, right, Paul? We're like, okay, why, why didn't Jesus, excuse me, why didn't God send his son to be born from an experienced mother? Why, why a mother who's having a first child? Secondly, why, why did God send his son to be born of a virgin? I mean, talk, talk about a woman who would be marginalized by society if people found out that she was pregnant out of wedlock in a society and in a culture and in a religious upbringing that if you are pregnant out of wedlock, you are to be stoned. But Jesus was born of a woman who was inexperienced, who was destined as a result to be killed, Sends it not to a woman that has the means to save her, but rather sends her to a woman that has no dowry. We find the story in the book of Genesis 27. We find the story of Rebecca when she's brought home to marry her husband Isaac. And when Rebecca leaves her father's house, Rebecca leaves her house with a dowry, many, many jewels, much gold and silver, that when she marries Isaac, she's got something to hand down to her children. But yet... God sends is to send his son to be born to a woman that has no dowry. And then who's to be the father? God's sense is strange. The father of the child was going to be an older man who already has children. A man who isn't a wealthy man. In fact, he has no trust fund for Jesus. You guys know what a trust fund is? Is a wealthy man. They have a bank account that whenever their children are born and they come of age, 20, 21, or 25, or 30, whatever it is, they get money to live for life. Joseph has no trust fund for Jesus. Man, God, God must be a very poor under, uh, uh, economist. God must not be a good financier. He, he's setting up his son to start out in a poor home. He, here's the... Here's the owner of the universe. Why didn't he pick a rich man to be the father? I mean, he already made a first mistake. He picked Mary, a virgin, unexperienced mother, who is now marginalized in society. Mistake number one, maybe God was going to fix that by, marrying, by sending Mary to marry a wealthy man with a trust fund for Jesus. But no. God's sense makes, makes no sense. Joseph isn't a wealthy man. There's no trust fund. But rather... Joseph is what you would call a blue-collar worker. He was a carpenter. Jesus was to learn under the tutelage of his father what it meant to have raw hands from working with wood and steel all his life. A back that is sore. I mean, most fathers, whenever they think of their children and their future, yes, you want to teach them enough work where they learn what it means to be a man. But most of them will want their kids to say, you know what, we want you to go to school. We want you to be, make something, quote unquote, of yourself. In fact, society, they appreciate the blue collar workers, but they don't put them in positions of authority and pol political authority. They, they don't elevate them to status. They, they appreciate and they recognize, oh, you know, the, the janitors in society and those that sweep the streets and, and those that build their homes. We appreciate, oh yes, we need them, but we don't vote them up to parliament. God is setting up his own son for a destiny of failure. God's sense makes no sense. And the Christmas story is building upon the element of God's way of thinking being completely backwards to what is logical. The next thing we find in the Gospels that Jesus didn't even go to school. <laughs> 
His mom was his teacher. What kind of logic is this? He was supposed to be the shepherd of Israel, but he was not to be taught by the rabbis, the greatest religious leaders of the time. Why would God want his son to be raised and educated in in school from a girl that was 16, 17 years old? It doesn't make any sense. The whole Christmas story is absolutely contrary to human understanding and logic. If I were God, I would send my son to be born from an established household with a woman that has helps of servants to help her raise her child, with a father that is wealthy to make sure that my son has no need of anything. And then I would instruct periodically through my angel Gabriel to tell Mary and Joseph, hey guys, send him to Harvard. Send him to Oxford. I want him to go to the best university and receive the best education. If I were God, I would do completely the opposite of what Jesus was raised to be. Think about it. Sometimes we judge God because he's so different from how we would do things. In fact, we live in a world that paints God as an idiot, almost as a non-being. Because if God were God, why would he do these things and allow for these things to happen? And Clearly, God must have favorites, but yet when we find if God had favorites, wouldn't he favor his own son? How, how many of you, whenever your children got in trouble in school or when your children get in trouble in church, you first take your own child's side? Are y'all following me here? God's logic, God's sense is totally backwards. And the revelation of the birth of his son is completely backwards. Makes no sense. His son wasn't born in a first class hospital with the best pediatricians, cardiologists around to be ready to attend in case something goes wrong. Rather, Jesus was born not at the top of a hill at the shining best hospital in town with the best physicians around. God sent his son to be born at that little hut at the end of the street where the lampposts don't work anymore. In America, there's a saying that people that are poor are born on the other side of the train tracks. Guess familiar with that concept? Jesus was born on the wrong side of town. Human sense. My son would be born, God's son would be born at the best place with all the attention. But yet Jesus was born on the wrong side of the tracks. He was born in a manger. And you know what? Maury, I appreciate you building this manger. I would imagine that the manger that Jesus was born in was probably, of course, a little bit bigger than this. But it probably, the people that built that manger probably didn't put much time and thought into it. They probably said, we need, I need shelter from the rain for my, for my cattle and for my sheep. I need a place to store my hay. And they probably built it over the course of a day or two. But they didn't think about whether wind would come in. I mean, they're animals that were going to stay there after all. Maury, when they built this, they probably didn't think, well, let me, let me make sure that I put good sealer on it to make sure that the wood lasts. Whenever the manger was built... The people that built the manger 2,000 years, they weren't thinking about a man being living there, much less a baby. Be- no, they were thinking of a place for the hay and for the animals. It makes no sense. Why would God send his son to be born in a place where animals would be? He was not born in a rich man's home. He was born in a, in a stable with three walls, not even four. Jesus wasn't born in the capital city. Wasn't in Jerusalem. But rather he was born in one of the humblest towns in all the region of Judea. The town of Bethlehem. Yes, it was a town of David. Yes, prophetically speaking, we understand that the Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem. It was prophesied by the prophet Haggai. Yes, we understand this. But, but, why the smallest of the cities of David? David had 30 cities. 30. Why Bethlehem? A little rinky-dink town. Uh, I've had the opportunity to travel through Scotland. I've driven through some very small little villages in Scotland. 
Why would God send his son to be born in a little village when he could have chosen Edinburgh, or Glasgow, or, or Aberdeen? Or, why, why, not, why, why would God not send his son to be born in the best city? Then when people ask him, Jesus, where were you born? I was born in Jerusalem, everybody. I am from Jerusalem. Hey, Jesus, where were you born? I was born in Bethlehem. Humble town. Jesus' parents, their marriage, their wedding wasn't announced at a local newspaper. The, the, the ministers weren't lining up to say, oh, I'll officiate. Do you know that whenever just recently we think about Harry and Meghan, if I can call them that, when they married, do you know their list of ministers was extremely long? How many people would have quit everything to be the officiating minister at the wedding for the royals? There wasn't a royal around. There, there, wasn't a, there was no lining up of ministers to say who's going to marry, uh, marry and Joseph. It was in America what you call a shotgun wedding. A shotgun wedding in America is you got my daughter pregnant, you marry her, or ch -ch -ch. shotgun wedding. It was an elopement. There weren't ministers lining up to be saying, well, well can you tell me your question? Well, I married Mary and Joseph. In fact, people were running away. Ministers did not want to be the ones to say, I married Mary and Joseph. There was no announcement on the paper. There was no recognition. There was no, there was no news networks going all over the place. Mary and Joseph have married everybody. No. The hosts that attended the wedding and the birth of Jesus weren't the nobles. They were shepherds. <laughs> the attendees at the birth of Jesus were shepherds. I mean, the shepherds were the humblest of all the workers. They took care of the sheep that belonged to others. A shepherd's wage was one sheep for every three months of work. That's what they would get paid. You would spend 90 days a year, pretty much, 90 days, excuse me, before you were able to get paid one sheep. In other words, you would make your wage a year was four sheep. How much you get paid? Four sheep. What do you mean four sheep? These were the nobles that attended Jesus' birth. I mean, when we think about the, even our own children, we think about you know, baby showers and all these different things. How many people bring gifts? How many people are presents? But it was shepherds that came. Those that brought gifts to Jesus' birth they weren't the prominent leaders in Israel. It wasn't Caiaphas that came to the birth of the Savior. It wasn't Annas who came. It wasn't any great Pharisee that came say, "Oh, I, I was there when Jesus was born." There were no prominent religious leaders that came to the birth of Jesus. It was strangers from another land because his own people weren't even aware that he had been born. It doesn't, doesn't make any sense. Why would God have his son be born in this way? A simple, uneducated woman, simple, poor man, a manger with hay and animals, with shepherds and strangers to be born. Let me tell you something this morning. Jesus' birth and the manner of his birth is to teach us that God deliberately did not favor his son so that you could be favored in his place. God's sense is completely and will remain completely irrational to the human mind if we don't understand the motive 
of God's sense. The motive behind how God operates to the birth, the death of His Son, is so we could be favored. I'll close with one passage. Go with me to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. And I'm going to say a word and then I'm going to substitute it in a few times. Listen closely. 1 Corinthians 1 and follow along your word. 1 Corinthians 1.18, it says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For the birth of Jesus being born in a manger is foolishness. For the birth of Jesus of a virgin woman out of wedlock is foolishness. For the birth of Jesus to a man that is destined to be poor is foolishness. This, this that we are celebrating <laughs> over the next few weeks is foolishness to the world. Because to the world, God's modem operandi makes no sense. It's foolishness. But to us who believe, to us, to us who believe, it is the power of God. This, this season... We'll receive a lot of gifts. <laughs> we'll eat a nice meal for Christmas Eve or Christmas lunch or breakfast, whatever you do in your family. But I want us to consider that when we think about our warm hearth, when we think about our warm house, all the food at our table, the clothing on our back, the gifts that we have, let us consider that we have these things because He had none. He went without so that we could always have. He experienced the cold and the bitterness of life and sin. So that we can experience the grace of our Father. Lord, we thank you. Because you don't think like we think. Because your ways are not like our ways. We would be tempted to do things in an exuberant in a magnificent way. But yet, Lord, as we look at the course of human history over the past 6,000 years, we think about how many times we've messed things up because we've done things our way. So, Lord, as we reflect upon the birth of our Savior, Jesus, upon the fact that you sent him to be born with and around and, and in a manner that is completely illogical in the scope of human perspective, yet you did it in this way so that we could experience all that Jesus did not have. May we always, Lord, may we always, starting today at least, be focusing upon who Jesus is, his birth, his death, and his resurrection. That our life may be saved as a result of all that he has done for us. We thank you, we pray. In the name of Jesus, amen.